All right, I'm going to gesticulate wildly instead of use this pointer. But I um, want to ask, it looks to me like this is a mixed audience. So can I find out how many people are practicing medicine are already done with their training? OK, and how many people are in residency or fellowship? OK, and how many people are medical students now? OK, and are there any pre-meds here? Welcome. OK, great. Well, um, today I just want to show you the, the slide that my students are going to definitely roll their eyes at. I'm going to nod at you, OK? You guys know what this is, right? It's the? Cosmic Lottery. Cosmic Lottery. So whenever we at UF talk about health disparities, I always start with the Cosmic Lottery because this is what determined which egg and which sperm made you. And you didn't pick them. So it's not your fault. But for most of us in this room, we got pretty lucky in the Cosmic Lottery. At least we've had educational advantage, right? We can all read and we're all seeking higher ed or we've got it and we're going somewhere with our careers. But a lot of patients that we see in the clinic didn't win the cosmic lottery. And that's, that, this is gonna harken back to the talk that you just heard. You cannot blame people for their cosmic lottery, right? Okay. And this is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So how many of you have heard of Maslow's hierarchy of needs? I bet all the pre-meds have because didn't you have to know that for the new MCAT? Love it. All right, so um, I like to review the Maslow's hierarchy of needs because I did not learn about it until I had finished practicing OBGYN, which is way too late to learn this. Everybody needs to understand Maslow's because if you look at Maslow's, um, there are a couple of things that are going to jump out at you. Physiologic needs that are not met, we all recognize as neglect, especially in children. You know, if we're not feeding them, they're failing to thrive, that, that would be um, a lack of physiologic needs being met. And again, with children, if their safety and security needs are not met, these are children that are abused. And then this sense of love and belonging. If you don't get your sense of love and belonging at home or at your marching band director, office or wherever you might get it at school or your faith community, you're going to be looking for it from your peers. And if your peers are abusing you in the form of bullying, you can see how your self-esteem is not going to properly develop. Doesn't this all make sense? And then imagine that you become pregnant when you're forced or coerced to have sex. Imagine what kind of a parent can you be for your child if you're Maslow's has not been met, how are you going to provide Maslow's to your child? And yet if you talk to teen moms, a lot of them want the child desperately because they believe that the child is going to fulfill their Maslow's. They're not going to use the term, but that's what they want from their baby. And that's, that's backwards, right? We need to have our own Maslow's satisfied before we can raise our children. Okay. So if you kind of reframe in your mind that the failure of reaching Maslow's hierarchy of needs is trauma, is the result of some kind of trauma, and the trauma explains a lot of the health disparities that we see, you can reframe in your mind everything that you understand about health disparities. And it ceases to be a simple matter of what's your race, what's your ethnicity, where were you born? You know what I mean? You guys have heard me say this over and over. And intergenerational violence is a really scary thing that I did not learn about at all when I was a medical student. I didn't really understand it at all when I was in OBGYN. And then I began to understand it as a pathologist doing autopsies, which is like at the wrong end of life to be getting this. So I, so I want you to get it now, OK? So we can begin to apply this understanding of intergenerational violence. So I'm going to remember when you learned about acid-based metabolism Dr. Winner put those slides up there and you were like, wow, he's a really good teacher, but I'm not sure I get this. And then the first day you stood by the bedside of somebody who was in acidosis and you had to learn how to management, it became seared in your memory. The experiential learning was way better than trying to get it from the PowerPoint. I'm going to tell you about my experiential learning about this, because I think telling more of a narrative story may make it stick a little bit better. That's what I'm going to try to do. Okay. 
So um, these are the adverse childhood experiences. Now, how many of you, you mentioned that you didn't learn about this until late. This is way too late, but Felita and Anna didn't even publish this until the, early, the late 90s, I think. Yeah. So has, has everybody heard of Felita and Anna's adverse childhood experiences, the 10 things that can traumatize you as a child? And, and they're all here, emotional abuse, you're fat, you're stupid, you're ugly, sit down, shut up, we wish you'd never been born. That's emotional abuse. Physical abuse, we know what that is. Sexual abuse, we know what that is. Emotional neglect is children whose parents are distant either because they're on drugs or they're mentally ill and they're just not doing any serve in return with their baby's brain. Um, physical neglect is the same. I'm, I'm in my own cloud of depression, therefore I'm not hearing my baby cry, therefore I'm not feeding my baby or changing their diaper. Um, Parental separation or divorce is traumatic for children. No matter how hard you try to not make it traumatic for your children, it is traumatic for their chil your children because they innately love the parents. Um, if um, children observe one of their beloved parents being treated violently or a beloved caregiver being treated violently, that's a trauma. An addicted parent, a mentally ill parent, and incarceration of a parent. So if you think now, if, you, if any of you have um, heard of the book, The New Jim Crow. What we're doing with mass incarceration of young black men, we're creating a terrible situation for their children. We're not keeping them from fathering children, we're keeping them from being fathers. Think about that. Okay. So, what can we do as physicians? Well, first of all, we can try to pick up on the clues of trauma, which were beautifully outlined. I don't need to repeat that. And there are ways that you can talk to patients about these things without being judgmental about it. And um, I know when you're out in the hallway talking about your patient with your resident, you can be very judgmental in your language. And if you have to do that in order to fit in with the culture of being a doctor in training, don't let it get in your soul, okay? And when you're interacting one-on-one -on -one with your patient, find ways to talk to them where you're not blaming them for the trauma that occurred to them. So instead of saying, um, what's wrong with you, in, in my mind, what's wrong with this patient, ask, what happened to this patient? Why is this patient morbidly obese? Why is this patient addicted to pain medications? Why is this patient smoking and not quitting? Why can't I make a dent in this patient's depression? All the things that frustrate you, when you put your white coat on and you go in the clinic and you think, I'm gonna help somebody today, and you walk out of that room with sag shoulders going, I didn't get anywhere, it's, it's traumatized patients, okay? And so um, when you can find out about the trauma, they won't always reveal it. But if you're the kind of person, and some of you med students, I know, I've had med students come back to me and say, why do they always tell me about domestic violence? I'm always the one getting it. You've got it plastered on your forehead. I'm safe, you can tell me. You may be that one. So it's really nice to know a few things to say. And if you don't have anything else to say, just say, it's not your fault. And you would be shocked how many people are so relieved to have a person in authority, namely you in your white coat with your stethoscope around your neck, saying it's not their fault, after their abusive partner's been telling them for 10 years that if they just cleaned up the kitchen right, they wouldn't get socked in the face? It's, it can be a very eye-opening moment and a transitional moment in someone's life who's being chronically abused. And then the other thing that's been the hardest for me to learn, and I'm just beginning to get on the verge of this, is to figure out how to enhance resilience in our patients. And you had some sessions during this meeting on resilience. I was so happy to see that in here. And I think that was our resilience we were talking about. How do we remain resilient as young physicians, right? We need to sleep. We need to eat. We need to do something pleasurable every day. We need to have some kind of a, oh, that's a really nice chime. Was that a time for me? Okay, uh, you need to, you need to um, have a mindfulness discipline of your own. And by that, I mean you need to do yoga. You need to, um, I, do, I do forest meditation. I go out in the forest on my horse and I, and I just feel my blood pressure go. Um, you need to do something for yourself, but you also, once you've learned to do all these things, make sure your patients do them. Because that'll help with that hypertension that you just can't make a dent in. 
So um, if you have or have not seen these ACEs charts before, I just want to point something out. Because when I put that list of 10 things up here, there were probably some of you out there going, yep, I got that one, yep, I got that one, yep, I got that one. And it does not mean that you're doomed. What it means is that your risk of smoking or being depressed or attempting suicide is increased. But I want you to notice something on everything, uh, every single one of these that Fleety and Anna put together. This isn't my data. The majority of people who had six or more ACEs are not currently smoking. Why? What is it about those 84% of people that they don't have to be addicted to cigarettes? Think about this. And let's see some more of these. So even IV drug users, well, only 3.5% or the, or the risk, yeah, 3.5% of people inject drugs who've had all these ACEs. That means a majority don't, okay? So we got to really wrap our brains around what keeps people from getting into these unhealthy behaviors. And also we notice that people that do express these unhealthy behaviors seem to stack them up. They're not just obese. They're also obese and addicted to pain pills, right? They usually come in groups, and that's why you just sag your shoulders when you go out of the room like, I don't know how to dent this thing. OK, so alcoholism is another one. Keep going. And depression. Notice that more women report depression than men. We knew that, right? And suicide attempts are high in people that have these adverse experiences as children. And then I think this is one of the most interesting ones. Women, about 15% of um, women who have high ACE scores will be a victim of domestic violence in their adult lives. But not so many men. But maybe we're asking the wrong question because I don't think men will ever admit they're victims of domestic violence. So if you're a burly guy and you work in a factory someplace and your wife clobbers you in the face and you have a black eye and you go to work with a black eye the guys are all going to say, oh, ha, 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 your wife clobbered you, right? And you're going to say, well, no, I ran into a door or I tripped over the dog. You're going to give an excuse. If you're a guy, you're never going to say your wife clobbered you, right? So I think men, even on a questionnaire, will not frame that experience as being a victimization. But they are. They are. Look at the next one. What if you ask people who've experienced ACEs, whether they perpetrate domestic violence, then women say yes. Well, who are they perping on? Not all of them have girlfriends, right? A lot of them have boyfriends. They're perping on men. So therefore, men are victims. They just don't frame it that way. OK. And this is attempted suicides. If you're in psychiatry, a shocking number of people will attempt suicide because of their adverse childhood experiences. And then we never really address it. We just kind of address the current thing that they're dealing with and not the past things. OK. So then I wanted to point out about telomere shortening. Have you heard of this? So have you ever noticed that when you see homeless people, they look so much older than their stated age? And I always thought, I was so dumb. I thought it was because they had that sun-exposed skin. They were just out in the sun all the time. That's why they looked older. No. They started looking older when they were little. In fact, they might have started looking older by virtue of their placentation when they were born. Haven't you been in the NICU and seen those wizened little babies? And the nurses are going to say, this one looks like a little old man? Could be true. Could be that all that stress began in utero, and that the telomeres are already short. And there's evidence to show that children who are abused between the ages of zero and five already have shortened telomeres by five, six, and seven. So that means you're aging fast, and you will appear older than your stated age, which is something autopsy doctors always comment on on the report. It's one of the first things we look at. OK? So now back to my narrative. Once upon a time, I went to see the county sheriff in Alachua County, and she told me that that little M place that's shaped like a triangle had more calls to her for service than any other part of the county. And she manages a huge county, huge rural areas, and she has to apply as many deputies in that little geography, which is like 
one and a half square miles, as she does to giant swaths of rural Alachua County, because by contract, she has to answer her calls within a certain number of minutes of receipt. And so I said, wow, that's really interesting, Sheriff Darnell, because it happened to coincide with my map, which is the next one, which was showing where the Medicaid births were condensing. So that triangular area right there to the left of I-75, where those two green stars are, that's the exact same place that had the most calls to the sheriff. And that was the day the sheriff and I stared across her desk and said, Sheriff Darnell, do you mean to tell me the place in Alachua County that has the highest concentration of vulnerable mothers and babies is also the place that makes the most calls to you? And she said, we must do something. This, this was a very weird uh, and mind-blowing moment in my medical career when I realized that crime had something to do with Medicaid births into poverty. So what we decided to do, and somebody alluded to it in the intro, is we decided to take a mobile clinic around. And aren't they cute? These are our students who um, got the thing started. We have it running every day of the week, every evening of the week. The students run it in the evenings. We run it during the days. And you wouldn't believe how many people would like to have birth control in those hotspots that we picked because that's where the Medicaid births were concentrated. Isn't that interesting? So just because people have a lot of babies doesn't mean they wanted them, right? They might have been coerced. They might have been forced. And the type of contraception that they need is what kind? Larks, long-acting reversibles, right? Because the men cannot get in the way of their decision to not have a baby that year, OK? So then the sheriff gave me her data on domestic violence reports in that little spot lit up again, and so did some other very interesting spots. And then we decided to get a map from DCF, our Child Welfare Agency, of child maltreatment. And again, some of those hot spots showed up. So now this is building in my mind how this intergenerational violence might be happening, right? Children born into poverty, domestic violence, child abuse. Now I have two generations of trauma. OK, so the next thing that happened was in Alachua County, we started to review deaths due to domestic violence. And we had a series in our eight county area. And the people at the table were so forthcoming with information that we found something we never expected to find. And that was that our child serving agencies knew about those families before they were young people who killed one another in a domestic violence relationship. They knew about them as children because of the child abuse that was going all around in their parents or the domestic violence between their parents. Can you believe this? And here we are, this room of really smart people going, oh my god, intergenerational violence. We never even considered that. We must address the surviving children because they're going to be the next generation of victims and perpetrators unless we do something major. And one of our students wrote a paper about that. You're getting my timing just right. Um, wrote a paper about that um, that went in our newspaper. It was a commentary in the newspaper. And our um, newspaper put this really interesting cartoon on it. So there's a judge over there saying to this kind of tough looking guy with a baby tombstone next to him, saying, where did you get the idea that child abuse is an acceptable behavior? Pointing to his father, who's got a tombstone for his mother right next to him. And then if you go one generation back, there's a lot of bruised looking people and tough looking people um, going back generation after generation. And that cartoon came from Arizona. It had nothing to do with our work in Florida, but obviously other people have seen this pattern. So you may have heard of this terrible case in Bell, Florida, where um, Don Spirit, who's the square up in the upper left-hand corner, called the police and said, they're all dead. By the time you get here, I will be too. He was. He committed suicide. And he had just murdered his daughter, Sarah Spirit, who was 28, and her six children, who ranged in age from two months to 11 years. All dead. Now, who survived? His, Don Spirit's wife, Christine Jeffers, who had managed to get away from him and lived in a different city, had retained her um, unmarried name. And I'm quite sure that Sarah would have been happy to take her six children to live with Christine. 
only I'm sure Don told Christine, I'll kill you all. You cannot have those children. So Sarah called DCF and said, my baby daddies are both in jail. James Stewart and Edward Kuhlman were both in jail for drug violations. And Sarah had six children, and DCF couldn't place them. It's just too hard for DCF to place a mother and six children. So they said, OK, you're going to have to live with your dad for a while. And in the meanwhile, he killed them all. So it just shows there was domestic violence up there. Sarah and her two boyfriends had um, that squiggly line means a conflicted relationship. And a lot of people wound up dead, tragically. So let's, let's go to resilience, because resilience is the only thing that trumps this. And that's something that we need to learn how to develop in ourselves and our patients. And basically, it's meeting everybody's Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which is really obvious. If we're raising our own children, we're going to seek to do that, aren't we? But anyone who winds up in a caregiving role, and it doesn't matter if it's a 16-year-old sibling or an aunt or a foster mom, um, they need to have their Maslow's met for themselves before they can adequately um, provide Maslow's to children. And if they can't, if they're in that caregiving situation, then we, as society, as community, including the health profession, need to figure out how to get those Maslow's needs met. And um, there are some measures now of resilience in patients that you can do. If you Google this, resilience measures, you can find some. The Connor Davidson is the one that's got the most validity. And there is a short version that has only 10 questions you can ask your patients. And it's been validated in children as young as age 10. And they're questions like, I think of myself as a strong person when dealing with life's challenges and difficulties. It's things like, I can maintain my sense of humor when things don't go well. And believe it or not, there's research now to show that you can lengthen your telomeres. So once your telomeres get short, are you thinking of your wrinkles now? <laughs> once your telomeres get short, you can lengthen them again. So this is a reversible change in your chromosomes. I love it. I love it. I retired. I quit my crazy whatever job. And now I'm taking care of my resilience. It's fantastic. So you need to be resilient. So you can show your patients how they can be resilient. And then there's a way you can figure out if your service that you provide is trauma responsive. How much time do I have? How am I doing? Five minutes? OK, I'm going to finish. Good. So um, I went to this meeting last summer to learn everything I could about resilience. And this guy, Michael Unger, is a, an extremely charismatic faculty member at the University of, um, of Dalhousie University in Nova Scotia, Canada. And he gives a really good party, by the way. <laughs> so he, he developed this scale that they use in the child serving agencies. And the children they serve are like adolescents that are kind of foster care runaway type kids. And they ask, they ask them these questions, and I'm going to show you what they ask. Because you could ask these about your own service provision. You're probably not ready to ask your patients this. But I can tell you, if we asked our mobile clinic patients these questions, we'd do really good on it. So wait till you see what they are. Well, first of all, overall, I'm satisfied with the services I received. Everybody should be asking that in their clinics and in your hospital. It's like de rigueur. It's like elementary patient satisfaction. But now it gets a little harder. I had a say in how this service was delivered to me. Ew. I don't think my hospital does a very good job of that. Now, the mobile clinic does. Does, because the care coordinators say, do you want this service or not, right? Think what the care coordinators do. They grease this. I could get the service when I needed it. That means without an appointment sometimes, right? How many of our service provision um, outputs are without appointments? Not too many, but the mobile clinic does that. That's good. The location of the service was convenient. Well, what could be more convenient than the clinic rolling into your neighborhood? So I think we're going to do OK on that one. But for the rest of us, aren't the clinics put where we can park nicely, where we can get to them? They're not necessarily on the bus line. Where the rent is cheap? I don't know. But we don't necessarily think about where the patients need to be. 
And then did the staff respect the religious and spiritual beliefs of the patients? Ooh, and I bet, ooh, I bet with our Muslim patients, we mess that up all the time. And we probably disrespect some of our Hispanic patients. Ooh, think about it. Who they want in the room, who they want told the news or not told the news. We, and we really think if we're culturally competent, we know how Hispanic people want to be treated. Well, guess what? There's a lot of different ways that Hispanic people want to be treated. So we probably shouldn't talk about cultural competence so much as cultural humility. Treat every patient like whatever their needs are, the needs you're going to meet. Not what you think Hispanic patients need or what you think Muslim patients need. Do you agree with me? And as long as you've got your mind framed that way, it works. Staff spoke in a way that I understood. That means that we didn't use jargon, that we used um, written materials that are within their literacy comprehension level. Oh boy, nothing from a .gov website is going to work for this. <laughs> well, think about it. You know how those .gov things got written? Interns, smart kids from Ivy League schools went for the summer, and the, the government gave them this job to write this brochure for something, and they do a lovely job but no one can read it unless you're college educated. Yeah. Um, staff were sensitive to my culture and ethnic background. I'm now better able to cope when things go wrong. That would almost imply that you've offered some resilience to a patient because the way you offer your services means that patients know what to do when things go wrong, know who to talk to, where to go. And then you always want to know if there was a service that the patient needed but they could not get. Don't be afraid to ask that question. Sometimes the patients will tell you something you're not ready to accede to. Like I know in the mobile clinic, they wanted hot meals served. Well, you know, we're not a catering thing. We don't have a food serving license, right? And then um, I had a student last summer who did a really cool project on how to get African American men to allow a digital rectal exam to screen for prostate cancer. You know, a lot of men will just say, uh-uh, you ain't doing that. So um, here, here's what she um, derived from the female sexual assault literature that could be adequately applied to men. So I'm thinking we do this with everybody, right? You don't have to be a sexual assault victim to want to be asked, is this a good day for the examination? Because for whatever reason, it might not be a good day for you. Your babysitter might need to leave in five minutes. Uh, is there anyone you would like to have with you in the exam room? Now I know this, is, this gets a little trappy with the people who are being trafficked because they're going to say, yeah, I want my handler in the exam room because otherwise they're going to beat me, right? But in a normal circumstance, an African-American man might want his wife there. He might feel safe with her because she's never sexually assaulted him. She protects him. She takes care of him, right? Um, would you prefer a male or a female provider? Don't assume that females want female providers and don't assume that males want male providers. That's just totally cattywampus. People have their preferences. And then, and then in any kind of touchy exam, if you just start out, especially in GYN, by saying, you know what? You, we can stop at any time. We don't, we don't have to do every bit of this exam. Just tell me when you reach your, when you're at the end of your comfort level. And most patients, even if you're doing a sexual assault exam, if they just know they have that power to stop the exam, they'll allow the exam to continue and be completed. So I think you're verbalizing, I'm listening for you to tell me stop. I'm listening, so say it. And just think of all those teenagers and their bottoms flying all over the place and you're trying to figure out how to get the speculum in there. Oh, I can think of so many things I did wrong as an OBGYN. Ask us to stop. And then if you want a generic way to ask about trauma, just ask if anything bad, sad, or scary has happened. Even children understand bad, sad, and scary. And they'll tell you something. And um, you know, for, if you're talking to a parent of a nonverbal child, what's changed in your home life? Are there new people in the home that might explain bedwetting? And then that might explain some of the differences that you've seen in behavior. And now my time is up. Do we have time for any questions or no? no. I used question time too? No. 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 OK. Well, I'm not leaving. So um, thank you for your attention. Wow, everybody pay attention. And we have five 